I think that's a, a big part of the Bible that not many people understand. It's, it's not about morality. It's not like a tale of morality. It's a, it's a book that describes reality and it tries to assign meaning to it, like understand the meaning behind things. So sometimes people who want to see it as a moral tale might have a bit of problem with that because if you read the actual story and you pay attention to it, you, you realize that most of the time they're doing bad things and they're doing things that lead nowhere or they're turning in circles or they're, uh, they're doing something counterproductive or they're hurting themselves or they're going against the promises that they made. So the Bible isn't about morality. Well, it is about, everything's about morality in a way, but it's not mainly about that. It's about trying to understand how and why things happen. And with that insight, then you can deal with certain things the right way, in a way that won't harm you too much, or in a way that will help you. Hi everyone, welcome back to my podcast. In today's episode, I'm having a discussion with Matthew Pajot about ancient biblical symbolism. Matthew Pajot wrote a book titled The Language of Creation in 2018, which is an attempt to interpret the Bible by rediscovering its ancient cosmology. He's been independently studying Biblical Hebrew since the age of 16 and eventually continued with the Department of Religious Studies at McGill University, where he majored in mathematics and computer science. The language of creation reads a little bit like a computer manual as Matthew is sincerely a mathematician. The patterns in the Bible are understood in a way that I don't think I don't think that you will have understood it in this way before. I hope that you'll enjoy the episode of my podcast and I hope that you will learn as much from Matthew as I have. Thanks. I read your book once and then I read it probably halfway through again taking notes. Uh, the second time much more slowly. The first time it was just fascinating to read, I thought. And the second time I was starting to get more of an understanding. And so I'm hoping that today uh, you will introduce us to your book and the ideas in it. So why don't we start by you just uh, introducing the people who are going to listen to this about who you are and uh, about the book that you wrote. Okay, well, I'm uh, Matthew Pajot, and uh, basically I studied in mathematics and computer science, so not very much related to what I talk about in my book, but I've always been interested in symbolism and more generally just the Bible. Um, so, but my, my computer science and mathematics studies did help me too. I guess, develop the right kind of brain to understand certain things. Um, and I started to be interested in symbolism by reading uh, René Guénon. I don't know if you're familiar with that author. No. So he talks generally about symbolism, not just Christian symbolism. So that was a huge influence uh, on me. The first person basically that's, that I started reading that understood symbolism and thought with symbolism and also he has a general attitude about um trying to view the past in a different light you know not trying to interpret the past as we often do today with our own uh, perspective our own viewpoint he tried to understand it more with a traditional lens which has a very different uh, outcome mm -hmm. when you look at the past with and you try to use their own perspective it, it yields a very very different outcome because when we use our modern um I don't know, worldview, we end up kind of with a little bit of a cynical view on the past, I think. Um, well, that's my experience when I talk to, uh, I guess, scholars and people like that. When I talk to maybe priests and rabbis, they obviously don't have the same uh, perspective, but some of them do, which is to me is unfortunate. Some, some priests and rabbis have uh, adopted a modern perspective and it has kind of overtaken their their mind, but there's still some people out there who try to understand the Bible with a spiritual perspective and not a materialistic one. 
but it's not easy because you have to completely alter your your mind you have to completely rethink every single thing that we take for granted because we all have uh, presuppositions that we take for granted but we don't necessarily realize them right we don't we're not even aware of what we um, what we take for granted and then when you start trying to think with a different lens then you start to see okay there's a lot of things that I think mean you know mean X but they end up meaning something else if I look at it differently and that's basically what the whole idea of my book is about it's about trying to recapture um, a worldview that is that functions well with what's in traditional literature. Uh, so I chose the Bible because I'm Christian, but I could have chosen uh, different mythology. I could have chosen something else. It would have worked equally well, I think. Mm. Do you plan to do that? Uh, uh, I what I will do if I if I write something else is probably going to be try to write a commentary on other parts of the Bible like just a general commentary, an actual commentary this time, using a lot of what I talk about in my book and just going through an entire story. Uh, I was thinking about the story of Abraham and the story of Joseph mm -hmm. because they're fairly contained. They're self-contained, especially the story of Joseph. Uh, and the story of Abraham I've been working on for a very long time and I had kind of quit uh, on working on because I... It's a very strange story and it's very complicated. And I'm, I'm trying to get other people to help me. Uh, that's what I'm doing now, actually. I'm, I'm getting some people who are trying to help me. We're working together. We're, we're like sharing our, our interpretations. So maybe that'll help me uh, actually get something done. Uh, the, the others, like I said, the story of Joseph, I probably could write a commentary on that story right now. But I'm kind of a perfectionist, and that's my problem. If there's a part that I don't get, I don't feel comfortable talking about it with other people. It's like I feel like I'm uh, getting ahead of myself, so I just decide, usually decide not to talk about it at all, which might be a mistake. So maybe I'll... What would you feel the most comfortable talking about today? Um... I don't know. We can we can talk about some of what's in my book. If okay. you have questions or okay, I don't mind talking about anything really. No, uh, well, there there. Let's see. Where did I go? So, I'll start at like just what I looked at the other day. I was looking at it was page fifty eight. I was looking at it was from Abraham. The information transmitted to Abraham by the messengers came in the form of a simple promise. This promise is a clear example of a seed because it contains great implications with very little basis in material reality. Also, the promise informs Abraham of a future son, which makes it a perfect example of a seed. What is a seed but the promise of a future offspring? And so I've had, I've had ideas of when I first... I don't know, when I was in university, when I was young, in my 20s, early 20s, I saw a baby and I thought, I didn't think of the baby as a seed exactly, but I thought of the baby as far away in time, that we can't see it or understand it because it's not here and now. And then as a person gets old and you can see everything, every wrinkle, every pore, and then they move by you when they die, is a, is a passage of time. And I thought, that's a very strange thought. I don't know if that has anything to do with the way that you see the Bible, but it, it was a no, different... Has, uh, hmm. So what do you think of yeah. that and my idea of babies? Well, I think seeing a baby as a seed, it makes plenty of sense to me. Mm -hmm. That's It's like a human, a seed for a human. It's like a, a miniature human that hasn't developed yet and has everything ahead of it and nothing behind it. Well, it has a tradition behind it, but it's not its own thing so the baby will take from from the past and develop into something depending on the circumstances so it's very much a seed who knows what circumstances that person will end up in and depending on what it already is that it'll develop differently so a lot of it it's always about developing a seed into something so it's always about joining potential to what's already there 
So what's already there is, is, the, is like the seed. It has information in it. It's not just information, but it has information that hasn't yet developed its potential. And then I guess that's what living is. Living is developing certain potentials that haven't been developed yet and expressing it in different ways, depending on the situation, depending on the circumstances. Something, sometimes it gives something good, fruitful. Sometimes it gives, sometimes it gives something funny and not so fruitful, but still, still something that has a place in our world. I mean, it's not just about producing results. Sometimes it's about being wrong and looking like a fool for a while, you know, it's, it's part of life. So I think that's a, a big part of the Bible that not many people understand. It's, it's not about morality. It's not like a tale of morality. It's a, it's a book that describes reality and it tries to assign meaning to it, like understand the meaning behind things. So sometimes people who want to see it as a moral tale might have a bit of a problem with that because if you read the actual story and you pay attention to it, you, you realize that most of the time they're doing bad things and they're doing things that lead nowhere or they're turning in circles or they're, uh, they're doing something counterproductive or they're hurting themselves or they're going against the promises that they made. So the Bible isn't about morality. Well, it is about everything's about morality in a way, but it's not mainly about that. It's about trying to understand how and why things happen and with that insight then you can deal with certain things the right way in a way that won't harm you too much or in a way that will help you so by reading the stories you can see okay they wandered around here for 40 years let's say why did that happen and how did they fix it so you can get insights into your own life of course but you can get insights in general about uh, civilization in general there are certain things that, certain paths that if you follow will lead into really dark holes that you won't be able to get out of for a long, long time. And if you choose wrongly at a certain critical moment, so not every moment is a critical moment, but there are critical moments where if you choose the wrong path, you'll end up in a very, in a very muddy place where you can't get out. Like you're sinking, you're sinking, you can't get out. And then you have to figure out what you have to fix what you did, right? You have to choose differently, you know? Mm -hmm. And then it's like a puzzle that you have to solve, basically. Why am I in this situation? Then you have to find what you did wrong and solve it. A lot of the stories in the Bible are about exactly that. There's a there's a choice that was made. Well, that's how it starts with Adam and Eve, basically, right? Mm -hmm. There's a choice. And then they choose a certain path. And then after that, the whole, all of humanity's story is about we chose that path. And now we have to deal to deal with it, and then it's a puzzle. And then are we going to solve this puzzle? So it's it's always about meaning. It's not about just things just happen. You know, we we do things. It leads to certain understanding and certain insights. And then when you have the proper insight, you can fix a problem that was that happened sometimes a long time ago. Not even might not even be your problem. It might be a choice that somebody else made a long long time ago. And that has caused problems for you as an individual, but for, for your entire society. And then at one point you can say, okay, now we have to choose dif differently. And that will lead to something better, maybe. And then you'll see what happens. <laughs> so it's always a, you'll see what happens because sometimes you think you've got it, but you think you have the solution and then you do it. And then whoops, maybe it's not fully uh, understood yet. So sometimes so I think that's, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So, sorry. Sometimes in the Bible they'll say uh, generations. You know, generations went by, and so mm. this is something that isn't necessarily of our lifetime, but it's in our lifetime to solve a problem. It, that, but it wasn't necessarily begun with us. What we're dealing with in our lives sometimes is begun with us, but often. These are things that in societies that have been around because there were choices made before, but it's up to us to be inspired, right? To pay attention and find answers in today to problems from the past. And yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, someone like uh, Elon Musk, who's, 
you know, almost a magical thinker. He's he's, or at least he's uh, he's inspired deeply to create, and he's finding solutions. I think to questions in our society. They might not even be right, right? What he's doing, but something about them will probably inform us. I, I, so what we do, even if it doesn't work out, like that's the whole idea mm-hmm. of not being a perfectionist, isn't it? Something, yeah. right, right. So that you were talking about being a perfectionist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So even, even doing doing something, even if it doesn't work out, you're going to be informed. And yeah, and the more the more you have influence the more you have um reach the more your decisions are touchy and dangerous and uh, potentially good but also potentially dangerous right. so when you are high up in society or let's say influential you got a big responsibility there you got to be careful what you say and do because yeah. you could impact thousands of years of human existence so it's a big responsibility and that's why certain people, well, people like me, prefer not to have too much, uh, not to be too public. Mm-hmm. In what I understand, I, I share very little of what I understand. My book is a miracle that I wrote my book, actually. I'm not the kind of person that usually uh, speaks publicly or anything like that. Well, I was, you know, one of the stories that people really know very well is Noah, Noah uh, and the Ark. And can you tell us uh, the symbolism? that goes along with the flood and the ark as an example. Okay. Well, well, the way I, I understand it, it's always, everything is about uh, the interactions between heaven and earth, what I call in my book, heaven and earth. Mm-hmm. So it's what I mean by heaven and earth is basically the concept of, well, it's so fundamental, it's actually hard to describe. That's, the, that's part of the problem. That's part of why you have to give many, many examples. Mm-hmm because it's the fundamental uh, aspect of reality, so you can't describe it with something else because it's at the basis of everything, So, but I could still try it. Mean, it's something like meaning and facts. So heaven is meaning, where the meaning comes from, and the earth is where facts are, like potential, but also just things that are there. Mm-hmm. Um, so the flood is an example of when the meaning and the facts of the world begin to shift apart or they begin to be confused. There's a confusion between meaning and fact. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, um, well, things begin to dissolve and fall apart. So things become confused in their their identity. So you see that the story of the flood is is kind of the opposite of the story uh, of Adam naming the animals. So you have Adam that names the animals. So that's an example of giving meaning to factuality or giving meaning to what is. And then with the flood, you have the the opposite. So you have the identity of beings are, are falling apart and there's confusion, like there's hybridity between animals. So this is in tradition, but these are very well-established tradition that before the flood, there were a mixture of animals, like the they started to create hybrids oh, I see. of different animals. Mm-hmm. Now, this is important. It means something very, very significant. It means the identity of beings were getting confused. So that's why I said it's the opposite of Adam naming the animals. Because Adam, when he names the animals, that's what he's doing. He's giving a uh, clear identity mm-hmm. to beings. Mm-hmm. But then in the flood, this identity is being confused. Like they're being mixed together. Mm-hmm. And then... What Noah does, the flood, the idea that there's water covering the earth, that is what it represents. It represents a confusion between, or a, it's not just confusing in the sense that we don't that we don't know something. It's it's also like a fluidity of things. Mm-hmm. Things change always. They're, 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 the definition of things start to change in a way where there's nothing stable and there's nothing fixed and things get mixed up together. So that's what the water between heaven and earth represents. It represents a changing, a fluidity between between identities. And then, so what Noah does is he preserves those identities. 
See, he's not just preserving the animals, he's preserving the, the identity of the animal, mm-hmm. the spirit of the animals. Mm-hmm. And the text is written in a way for people to understand that because it says everything that has a breath will fade away. So the breath is is your spirit, right? Your identity. Mm-hmm. So he so what Noah is doing is preserving each animal in, in the ark to preserve them from the confusion. And then after the confusion passes, so he emerges again with all the species still still intact. So he's preserving, actually what he's preserving in a way is knowledge because he's preserving the names that Adam gave to the animals, the identity that Adam gave to the animals. That's also what he's preserving. He's preserving ancient knowledge in a way. Mm-hmm. It sounds weird to say like that, but if you understand the importance of the story of Adam and Eve, then you realize everything else in the Bible, you can explain it with the story of Adam and Eve. And that, that's actually a good exercise to do for someone who wants to try to interpret the Bible symbolically. You look at a story and then you try to re- look back to the story of Adam and Eve because that's like the foundation of human activity. And then if you can find analogies between the story of Adam and Eve and another story later, you get a lot of insights from that. Oh, okay. So then... Um... So then we can talk about another story when uh, Abraham is taking the Israelites out of Egypt and he takes them into the desert and then you, they end up in the desert once he uh, once they are freed from slavery in in Egypt then they go into the desert now can that be can that be taken back to Adam and Eve that story, or does it have to be the taking out of Egypt, the being in the desert, and then the um, the, the biting snakes, and and then the um, looking, you know, looking at the, then Abraham talking to God, and so how much of the story would I have to know okay. to go back to Adam and Eve? Well, that's the thing. Um there's a there's different levels of it Mm -hmm. okay that's what's interesting okay and when i say levels i don't mean in the sense that some are harder to understand or something i I mean there's different uh scales that's the real word i should say scales so every part of the story you can probably interpret it using uh what's in the story of adam and eve but that also there's the grand story that you can also interpret so that's kind of it's it's something that's difficult to do because we kind of get lost in the details sometimes. So, so I was talking about naming the animals uh, with Abraham. So mm-hmm. let's take an example. If you take the example of Moses that has the staff that changes into a snake. So that's an example. Let's say I want to understand that. Um, if I go back to Adam and Eve, uh, I understand that one of the most basic um, characteristics of humans is that they name the animals. So naming the animals can mean a lot of things. It means, it doesn't just mean giving them a name, but it also means I have authority over the animal, right? So I tell the animal what to do. I guide the animal. By the way, this is this can be interpreted also at many scales because the animal also means my, my body. My body is the right. animal, mm-hmm. okay? Mm-hmm. My spirit is like Adam, that naming the animals. It means I give meaning to my my passions and my flesh. That's mm-hmm. an example of an even smaller scale. So if we look at this, like I was saying, the story of Moses, and we look at the staff that changes into a snake, and you you read the story, keeping in mind the idea that Adam is supposed to name the animals. So then how can you interpret that? Um, you see that Moses has a staff. So the staff is basically a shepherd's staff. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's what do we use a a shepherd's staff for to guide the animals? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's a tool of naming the animals, if we take it in a more general sense of having authority over the animal. Mm -hmm. Okay. So his staff is an instrument of naming the animals. Mm -hmm. So what happens when he when he lets go of the staff, it changes into a, a snake. And then what happens? It says he flees from the snake. So that's in the story. It's a detail, maybe that you, you might not remember. But mm-hmm. I, I remember it because to me it has mm-hmm. it has a significance because of what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. So then you can ask yourself, okay, what is the opposite of naming an animal or 
having authority over an animal. Well, it sounds like running away from an animal and fear. Fear, yeah. The the opposite of having authority over the animal and naming the animal. So you see that, oh, this very simple uh, symbol is pretty deep, actually. You have, oh, the staff, which is a, which is controls the animal, and then when you let go of it or you drop it, it becomes an animal that scares you. So oh, the yeah. opposite of having authority. So that's just an example. So it's an example of taking a small part of the story and interpreting it using the categories, not of our usual materialism, but the categories that are afforded to us in the Bible itself at the beginning. And this is a general rule also. Um, the stories that are at the beginning of the Bible have a lot more information, contain a lot more information in a, in a like seed, in a seed-like uh, fashion mm-hmm. than the stories that come later. So the stories, the story of Adam and Eve and the story of Noah, they are a lot more potent mm. to, than the other stories. Uh, it's it's kind of hard to believe because they look like sim- really simple stories. You know, there's not much information that's in them, but they're written in a way that they, they are a seed that has a lot, a lot of, of information. And then you're supposed to use that as your lens to see other stories. When you start doing that, you start to see what the stories are about. It makes a lot more sense. Well, that's very interesting that naming the animals and that the animal is us and that mm-hmm. when you run away when you drop the staff and you're not naming and you, you so you so you recede from there in fear that's so interesting because you know when i was ill when i was ill i had cancer and i thought when they told me i was going to die because i was going to die in like 10 months or something 10 or 11 months they said i was going to die and the doctor was shaking when he told me he was you know worried about telling me this and I thought oh okay I'm going to die so I thought that I could accept this thing but then when I came home and I told my son I was trying to tell my son when I looked at him the love between us taught me that I that it wasn't my decision to even decide that right and it wasn't the doctor's decision either it was God's decision that I live or die and it took it was interesting because Deciding what I could do was, in a way, I think, fearful. You know, like, it was a way of me not looking at, I don't know, it's very, it was very odd because the decision to accept death like I did seemed like an act of bravery, but it wasn't an act of bravery. It wasn't. It was, uh... Well, something else that I don't quite understand. But mm-hmm. when I got home to see my son, I saw it more directly. And it was a relief, right? It was a relief to see that God was, even if I was going to die, even if I was going to die, it wasn't my decision. That was such a relief. And so I see that now. If you are, if you have the staff and you're naming, and so you have so God's will in mind always. So that's there. When you drop that, whatever you turn to, whether it's fear or control or trying to fix things, whatever it is that you're trying to blame, you're running away, then you're not with God. You're running away from this that you're talking about, this naming, this uh, um, being someone who is I don't know that's as much as I can understand <laughs> yeah well I mean generally like you're, you said it's it's about you you have to sometimes we lose control yeah that's just part like of every reality. day, every I mean, day. <laughs> yeah we lose control absolutely actually literally we, we lose control every day when we go to sleep I mean, uh-huh. People yeah. forget, forget how strange that is. I mean, we're in charge of our body, we're in charge of our mind for a while there during the day. We think we're on top of everything, and then every every day we lose it. <laughs> and we just become unconscious on the ground, totally vulnerable. It's a it's a huge deal. We forget. Sometimes we forget. We take for granted our reality. But when you you start to look at yourself, you realize 
what world we're living in, it's a strange thing that humans fall asleep every night. It's like we die and we resurrect every every day. Mm-hmm. So we lose control totally every day. So it's not a, it's not that unusual. No, and I've <laughs> been practicing we, letting letting. If I become uncomfortable, uh, I'm in a situation that I realize I don't understand. Then I let go and listen, listen to try to understand what's going on and something will happen to inform me without me being the one who's in charge. And I think that's, well, it's a miracle because you don't understand it, right? I don't understand it. It, it. I didn't do it. I'm not doing this, yet I have more understanding. Yeah. So what is what is that like? It's yeah. like dreaming. It's like dreaming. Yeah, you yeah. Asleep, it's like you dreaming. Lose control. You get information that doesn't really come from you or not from your conscious mind at least. Mm-hmm. So you get a dream, you can get insights from a dream. And also when you wake up you're replenished and you have a more a different kind of energy that you lost during the day the previous day. Yes, I so talked obviously- to people who were upset one day and they want to be relieved from their stress and they're upset and they go to sleep and the next day they're relieved of it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's like a miracle. It's yeah. a small little miracle that happens every day. Yeah. And if we understand through analogy, we, we can get that in life you go through losses of control mm-hmm. and then if you can live through it and if you can get back that you're replenished too and you have other insights. So it's not just energy, it's also insights about reality. And yes. About yeah. Yes, and I think that the uh, the more profound losses that we experience at different times of our life in our lives bring us more profound understanding. Right? My, my grandfather died when I was five years old, and I was sent to the playground during his funeral. So I and it didn't make sense to me, but it was it was a situation that made me think. Right? It made me think. Here's a loss and I'm not attending to it, what's going on? This It seems like this is an important occurrence, but here I am doing something that's pleasant. I don't understand. And so that was really good because it gave me a curiosity to what was more meaningful in life. There's something there that I'm not attending to, there's something important that I'm missing. Hmm. I I have to know more about that because there is an incongruity there, right? Mm-hmm. And that and that five years old, you know, you can be very very young, and still still see the significance of meaning. Oh yeah, I think you can get more probably when you're young. You can get more. You can get more insights when you're when you're very young. Yes, because that you're lasts not you through your whole life, mm-hmm. and then you can your whole life. You can try to figure out what what that was. You know, you can have an experience. So yeah, I read a lot of rabbinical stuff just because there's there's a lot of commentary on different stories that come from Jewish tradition, and it looks to me like it's pretty ancient stuff. So the more the older the older traditions you can find, usually the better. Because if they've lasted so long, it's usually because they have some something important contained in them, some insight. Because otherwise, they would have been forgotten a long time ago. So yes. if you can find some old traditions, it's always a good thing. But it's hard to appreciate these things because they. It's this is something we're not used to. It's we're not trying to understand complex things. We're trying to understand simple things. So there are certain certain ideas that are so simple that we don't we don't see them or we don't hear them and then you need some some examples i guess you need some analogies so that it becomes more concrete it becomes more um i don't want to say personal but yeah i guess personal uh you have to be involved in the knowledge see that's the difference it's not just information it's knowledge that you have to know because you experience it to some level and then once you experience it then you start to see the patterns everywhere else, not just uh, for your own personal life. You see the patterns everywhere, and then you realize, oh, things are a lot simpler than I thought. 
the motivations of people are more simple. It's, it's not so complex anymore. But then when you try to talk about it to other people, it doesn't always end up well. Usually people don't understand or... Well, some, yeah. some of the things that our society is going through now, I think you have a better, under, uh, a different understanding than a lot of people, how they would describe uh, what's happened. You know, like people aren't going to church as much. People are, it's a secular, it's a secular society. And um, the consequences, we're starting to see the consequences of the, a secular society. We're not just starting to, we're, yeah. we're it, it's been going on for we're quite a long time. We're seeing the culmination of it, I would say. Yeah. Yes, yes. I'm hoping that that's right. I hope he, I'm hoping that we've come far enough away from our belief that we're coming back to it. That's what I'm hoping. I think that's what's happening too. Oh, do you? Oh, that's, oh, yeah. re that's a relief to hear someone say that. That's well, I think there's going to be uh, something big coming. I don't think it's just going to happen smoothly. Mm -hmm. um, as I, I often say this to people I know, I, I often say we're not going to get out of this one without a fight, but mm -hmm. because I think something big is coming, and I think it will lead to rediscovering certain things that were forgotten uh, and uh, finding the importance of certain things. See, this yes. is something difficult to, un to explain, but it's not always about understanding something. It's about understanding the importance of something. You see, there's a difference. Mm -hmm. Do you see the importance of this thing? It's not just do you get it or do you understand it? Do you see the importance of it? And that I think that's what wisdom really is. It's about seeing the importance of things. And if you can see the importance of simple things, well, that's, that's real wisdom. And that's why um, ancient knowledge um, often sounds like a fairy tale or almost like a child's story mm -hmm. because they're not trying to explain complex things. They're trying to explain the simple truths that are at the core of existence, not the complicated stuff. The complicated stuff takes care of itself or whatever. There's an expert to take care of this complex question, mm -hmm. but that's... But for everyone, there's simple, simple at the core reasons for things to happen. And those are the things that we take for granted. You see, just before I was talking about sleeping, this is an example of a simple reality that we experience every day, but that we totally take for granted and that and we don't see it anymore. Like, what does it mean? Why do we fall asleep every day? We don't think about these things. That's just an example. But there's lots of examples of that. Like if you become aware of the relationship, for example, between your own mind and your own body, that is an extremely, extremely simple thing that we take for granted. But once you start thinking in those terms, then you start to see how things develop and you start to see where the problems arise between your, your let's say, your ideas and your, your actual self, you know. Um, so, yeah, we don't think in these terms anymore. That's the problem. We don't think at all in these terms. One of the things that you, people have to do to see these things is to have laws for themselves, discipline and laws. Mm -hmm. And the reason you want to have that is not because you want to be like a goody two-shoes or something like that. It's because you have to impose laws on yourself because when you do that, then you end up figuring out that you can't follow them you are unable to follow it. And then when you start to see that, you realize, okay, I am not in control of myself. Mm -hmm. What's going on there? I am not in control of myself. And this is the most important thing. It should be the most important thing. How am I not even in control of my own, my own uh, passions or my own ideas or my own? It's like there's an animal in me and then there's an intellect. And then I take for granted that my mind is in control of my body, but it's not. But until you impose laws on yourself, you, don't, you might not even know that. You might think you're in control of yourself, but really you're just going from A to B, from C to D. You're just going from one thing to another, contradicting yourself every day. Um, I mean, the, the example I always use is the example of the smoker, right? Uh, the smoker is like, oh, I'm going to stop smoking. 
uh, this week I'm stop, I stopped smoking. And then you talk to them a few days later and they're smoking. And you're like, well, did you say you were going to stop smoking? Oh, yeah. And then they've got some excuse or whatever. It doesn't matter. And then it starts all over again. And some people can do that for years and years and years. Say, I'm going to stop smoking uh, this month. And then every two weeks or every three weeks, smoking again. So it's just an example. We all do it. Not necessarily all oh, smoking, but smoking is a very clear and easy to identify example. But that's... Mm -hmm. The nature of human beings, we, we, we want things, we say things, we think things, and then we contradict ourselves. And then, but once you start thinking like that, at least you can realize the nature of your, your being and you can start working on it instead of just being someone who contradicts themselves all the time and just does whatever. So, do you understand what I mean? Is this, I sure do. Sense? I understand. Oh, uh, yes, I understand. It's like someone who says they'll exercise. Three, they start going to the gym after Christmas or after New Year's. People have New Year's resolutions and they always make New Year's resolutions and they last about a month, right? And then they go back to their nature because yes. it's very difficult because we aren't who we think we are. We aren't who yes. we think we are. Exactly. Yes. We're not who we think we are. That's exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's But sure. even realizing that is already... Saying that is already knowing more who, who you are. You, you right. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, that's something we've removed, the, the concept of sin. So that's what sin is. Sin means there's a discrepancy between what you think you are and what you are. Something mm -hmm. like that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. if, I, if I use the, the language of my book, it's a, it's a discrepancy between heaven and earth. So the heaven part is like the theory of who, who you think you are, and the earth is the actual facts of the actual manifestation of what you are. And sin is basically those things don't match, mm -hmm. right? It's different, that's for sure. So, yes, yeah, so sin, missing the mark, right? Missing the mark. Um, paying attention to our nature. And that, that's, a, that's a struggle that we all have, right? To, to uh, be in support of who we are. <laughs> right <laughs> because you want to be you have ideas of who you are or where you're going to go and what you're going to do but because you have a nature you have to first I have found in my 61 years you first have to make sure that you've taken care of your needs the things that you need to sustain your body have to be taken care of before you can go on and pursue whatever it is or converse with anyone else, uh, you have to take care of your needs. And one of the needs would be prayer, right? One of the needs would be prayer because that's a spiritual need. So there's spiritual needs, there's phys physical needs, there's, psycho there's psychological needs. For And to be in tune with who that is, that's... Uh, uh, that's a challenge of a lifetime. So, for instance, uh, I've always had a tendency to have a difficult time, um, an uncomfortable time with myself around having a rest. You know, so I don't want to have a rest. I want to, I don't want to leave the party. I don't want to leave the conversation. But if I'm tired, then I have to tell everyone in the room, I don't have to, but it would be kind of me to say what I'm doing. So to tell everyone in the room that I'm going to go have a nap. And actually, nobody really minds. Nobody really minds. So the only person who's fighting this necessity of going to have is me. Right? So I have a terrible argument with myself for no good reason because nobody else is concerned whether I have a 20-minute nap or not. It, it's me. So I've taught myself <laughs> eventually to say I want to nap, go have a nap, and when I come back, I'm a much more pleasant person. <laughs> right? I'm a much more fun-loving. I can partake in whatever's going on and understand it and have the patience for it. But learning to... You know, little kids, when they're to getting toilet trained, right? They fight. Sometimes they can fight against that. 
the to train ourselves to just use that body to train ourselves to do it we see that fight that fight continues through our lives doesn't it mm -hmm. that we fight against our nature and so maybe the bible is also telling us how how we are fighting against our nature and how to find a balance in all of the challenges that we are going to be offered and that we are going to, all the, all the twisted ways we're going to try to get what we need or what we want, mostly what we want. What we need, that, that's different than what we want, right? I think what we need is what is, you got to accept that. What you want, there's different motivations. Those take us places that can be good or bad, like you said, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and it's already hard to know what we want. That's part of the problem, too. It's actually not that easy to know what, what we actually want. That's part of the problem. Yeah. But sometimes you think you want something, and then when you get it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Maybe like that is uh, what happens. <laughs> somebody gets a they they go to university they they work in a career they climb up to the top of their rank whatever that is, and then they find out that being being in this place and working sixty hours a week means that's all they've got, and they don't have a family, and they don't have a community, and so they wake up sometimes to a reality. They get there and wake up to a reality and then make a change, make a change in life. But, you know, who knows how long it takes people to recognize that they've gone a long, a long, they can go a long ways towards something then realize it's the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. I've noticed that with my husband. He's very good at describing something he wants and then goes for a, and I think oh wow that's very interesting and I I should be you know supportive of this and everything and then we realize it's not a very good idea the the amount of effort he puts in is like a hundred percent of what I would put in after I've decided it's a good idea he puts that effort in before he's even decided if it's a good idea yeah right and mm -hmm. so I've learned now that, oh, I don't have to support that because he's just experimenting. I thought what he was doing was important work, but he was actually just experimenting. To me, it looked like a whole complete endeavor, but nope, not so. So we all have different natures. And to get along, we have to recognize what other people's natures are like. Yeah. As well. Mm -hmm. Right? And that's yeah, a whole... that's even harder. So. That's even harder. Well, I don't know. Sometimes I think it's easier for me to look at him and figure yeah, him yeah. out than it yeah. is for me to yeah. figure myself out. Because mm -hmm. when I try when I try to figure myself out, I, I, spend, I have to do a lot of listening. I have to just be... I have to be paying attention mm -hmm. and listening. Isn't when when uh, Moses has the serpent on the shepherd's hook, he tells the Israelites to look at the serpent, so they attend, right? They attend to it, yeah. Instead of run away, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Again, the same thing that you're saying. So they attend to this instead of run away, and then there's no more biting serpents so it's the same idea it's attention that's a really good way of describing that because jordan has told that story but i think the attention part of it is a, a piece i'm not sure he has that i'll have to ask him <laughs> because i think what what you're saying is uh well every eric who's helping us today he said your book was the best book he's read in a very long time and really. and I, I read books but your book I read pretty quickly it was readable and um, 
I wasn't worrying too much that I understood everything because there's a lot in it. And like you said, it's a different way of thinking. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very strange. I'm aware how strange it is. <laughs> yeah, one <laughs> of the questions. Not... Sorry? I have a question. So mm -hmm. one of the questions I had was about unleavened bread. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days and there shall be no leavened bread be seen with thee. Neither shall there be leaven seen with thee in all thy quarters. I thought, why in Exodus? Why unleavened bread? And then, so you talked about sacrificing an animal in this in the same part of the Bible, sacrificing the animal, cooking the animal. That is a rendering. That's a rendering of something. Whereas baking bread with yeast, that is a, a chemical process, right? It's a creation. It's different. It's different than... Explain to me the difference between the making of the bread and the sacrificing of the animal. Uh, I would say maybe just if we just look at the concept of leaven, uh, it's always a good idea to try to think with an ancient uh, mind frame mm -hmm. as we try to understand these things. Because like here you said, it's a chemical reaction. But right. for sure, that's not how they viewed it uh, in the past. You see what I'm saying? Right. So if we want to get what, see it how they saw it, it's better to not think like that. I mean, the way to understand it from, from what I've seen um, is basically that leaven is pretty much a symbol of time for the, for, for in the Bible, in, the, in that worldview. It's a symbol of time passing. Because that's what it is, really. It's about letting time pass for the uh, the dough to rise. Yeah, my so mom used letting, to make bread. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's about not letting the dough rise. So it's about uh, it, it's related to fermentation for sure. They understood that. Mm -hmm. So fermentation represents time in general. I think in mm -hmm. the Bible, it's the mm -hmm. concept of change and time and transformation. So it's that's what you meant by chemical reaction. It's a transformation, and in that sense, yes. Mm -hmm. So it's also about leaven is is a pretty uh, deep symbolism because it basically it means something like it's a puffing up of of something, but from nothing, right? Because the bread it doesn't get more substance to it; it just mm -hmm. becomes bigger. It's air, basically. It's mm -hmm. a lot of air. Okay, so mm -hmm. that is also. It represents the concept of time because time is something that doesn't accomplish anything. It's a cycle. Okay. So the idea is it's you're doing something and it's a big zero at the end. Okay. And it, this is not just a clever uh, little image there. That's what it is. Like the whole day passes, you start somewhere and you end up where you started. Mm -hmm. What was the point? There was no point. So that's the like the deep meaning of of time in the Bible, and I think in all ancient traditions, is about the cycle that goes that goes nowhere. Okay, mm -hmm. so if you read if you read the, uh, Ecclesiastes, mm -hmm. if you read that, so yes. that that whole book is about what I'm saying. Now. That whole book is about just describing the basic reality that we live in, which is a time reality where you do something and then the opposite happens and it cancels out what you did. Or you work all your life and then you die. So what was the point? Zero, zero. It's always describing the big zero. Of... So in, in the Bible, there's like a base reality, which is the reality of time. And that reality, it's kind of hard to understand because it's a weird kind of paradoxical, uh, I was going to say place to live, but we don't live in that place. It's, it's like the base reality of it is if you look at the whole giant picture, it looks like everything we do is useless and everything we start to build gets destroyed. So what's the point, right? So that's what the Ecclesiastes is talking about. He's describing that base reality of, of time. And that's in the Bible, that's the reality that's described on the first day of creation too, where there's just water everywhere and there's waves and there's, there's the day and night, but there's nothing being accomplished on the first day of creation. Um, so that's also what leaven represents also. It mm -hmm. represents that whole idea, the idea of puffing something up, 
based on nothing. It's not a big nothing that gets popped up. So sometimes that's useful to have, sometimes it's not. When it's, is it useful? When is it useful? When is it useful? Well, um, Jesus, I think, gives some examples of that. He said, just to add just a little bit of leaven and it makes things big fast. You know, that it's a way to make things big, important all of a sudden. Well, here's, here's an example. I mean, I'll give you an example of leaven. Uh, mm -hmm. You want to uh, show the importance of, of someone. Let's say you want to show that someone's important. So you make a big parade with a lot of music and a lot of balloons. That's all leaven right there. A balloon, oh, parade, yeah. music. It's all s empty stuff when you really look at it. I mean, it's not substance, but you still manage to use that whole big parade to show that this is important. This event is important or this person is important. So it's still useful to have leaven. But sometimes you want, you don't want that. Sometimes you want that, sometimes you don't. So my daughter got married last weekend. My daughter got married last weekend, right? And there were a number of weddings at this hotel. So there was a lot of pomp. A lot of pomp around a marriage. Because you want, why? Because you want to increase the significance of the event, right? That's yeah. why, yeah, that's why. And so you it want can to be, do it in a way that quick and shows, you know, it's, you don't want a complicated way to, to show it, you know, you don't want to build a giant statue for your wedding. You understand what I'm saying? You, you want to show right. the importance, but you don't want to have this giant, uh, construction uh -huh. or something like that. Cause you could do it that way too. You could build a giant statue of the married couple getting married. Mm -hmm. That would in a way that would be more ridiculous than to have a you know a bunch of balloons and party and cake. Yes, yes, right, right, right. Ah, okay. So I understand the bread now. So what about the sacrifice of the animal and how is that? You said it's rendering. It's a rendering. Oh, you want to understand flesh. the the concept of a sacrifice? Oh boy, that is. Is that, that is very like complicated? The most. Oh. Difficult. I'd say the most difficult thing to, I'm not claiming that I understand it, the whole thing myself, but I think it's more simple than, than we might suspect. What, the way I interpret the whole concept of sacrifice is pretty simple. To me, it's just a representation of the creation of the world. That's what it is. Like you have a lamb and the lamb, it's not always a lamb, but let's use the example of a lamb. Mm -hmm. And then there's, there's the blood that comes from the lamb and there's the flesh that comes from the lamb. So the blood represents uh, kind of what I, I was describing before. It represents the flood. It represents change. It represents fluidity. Uh, mm -hmm. It represents, like I was saying, the first day of creation where things are fluid. And so what do you use that for? You use that to uh, clean things. Clean. Clean means return them to their original state that's what cleaning is returning something to its original state mm -hmm. okay so it's a, it's like a cyclical thing you return yeah. it to what it was at the beginning uh and that's the meaning of a lots of uh, celebrations in the bible that's the meaning of the jubilee and that's the meaning of the sabbath it's about returning things to their primitive state okay so that's part of the sacrifice is the blood in the bible I don't know about every other tradition out there, but so it's like you have a, a, a lamb, you get blood from it. With the blood, you clean the slate, you restart. And the flesh represents, that's the part that's a little hard to explain because we don't think in those terms, but it represents creating an, a, a strong link between heaven and earth. Okay. So the flesh is, it's like, the material aspect has to be joined with the spiritual aspect. Okay. So the flesh is the material aspect. Okay. And you offer it to God because you want God to manifest concretely. Okay. So mm -hmm. that's why it's hard to understand. We don't think like that anymore, but I mean, it's not that hard to understand really. It, it, if I pay taxes, when you pay taxes, you're, you're doing something similar to a sacrifice. You're sending, you're giving material to a higher authority than you. Mm -hmm. And why? So that it can use that 
material to manifest its will. Okay, we might not agree with it. <laughs> I often don't agree with it, but I have to pay taxes anyway. So, but so the idea is you you offer concrete reality to a spirit or an idea or a principle so that it they join together. Okay. So so, so it, the yeah. hmm, so the mother Mary uh, when the she ascends to heaven she has her head in the stars and her feet and she's standing on a serpent so is that a similar idea of the material is down where she's standing on uh, the serpent and then her head is in the, uh, the spirit world yeah. is that a, is that a similar scenario probably to- yeah I'd have to think mm-hmm. about it a little bit but mm-hmm. I, I'd have to see also some images like that but usually yeah it represents you, your feet are on the ground or in matter and your head is in heaven so probably mm-hmm. yeah it represents something like that so so when you when they do a sacrifice that's what they do they mm-hmm. they they have water on one end and flesh uh, earth on the other so the flesh is the solid and the water is the fluid and they use the fluid for certain purposes and they use the flesh for another purposes. So the, 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 the blood or the water is used to clean, restart, and the flesh is used for building a link between heaven and earth, a proper mm-hmm. link between heaven and earth. That's the part that's hard to understand. I, I get it. <laughs> we really, really don't think like that anymore. But like I said, it's not that difficult to understand when, when you start to generalize it a little bit more. Uh, look, here's an example. Let's say, let's say I have a certain career that I don't like. Okay. And then I say, oh, I'm going to, I'm not pleased with this. This, this feels wrong. So what I have to do is I have to do two things. I have to give this one up, this career up. That involves probably Clean. something like resting a little bit, right? I mean, I have to move away from this. I have to change my, I have to um, get some rest from this life that I used to have. You have to like part from it, but in a way that's not too harsh. You know, you got to do it like, like a cycle. You got to, and then the other part is, okay, I'm going to get, get a new career. Now, this is the flesh part. Okay, so there's the blood part and then the flesh part. The flesh part would be something like, okay, I'm going to take some money that I have and instead of, uh, I don't know, buying uh, buying a new car, I'm going to invest this money in my new career. Mm-hmm. And then you, let's say, do whatever it takes to get your new career. Either you start a business or you go, you go learn something that you don't know. So this money is like the flesh that you're offering to the idea, the new idea that you have, which is to get this new career. Does that make a little bit of sense? So the idea is like heaven. It's pure. It's just an idea. If you don't offer flesh to it, it's not going to happen. Right. Right. You have to give it some substance, some uh, potential uh, resources. You got to send resources to your idea. Otherwise it's just an idea. It's just spirit. It's just, so that's, those are the two parts of the of the sacrifice now we, mm-hmm. it's associated with forgiveness of sin and things like that right in the bible but it i think i'm still right the, the basic fundamental meaning of the sacrifice is what i'm describing it's about creating a new world creating a world now in order to create a world you need water to wash away the old world and you need flesh to start the new build world the new world correctly right you have to offer that to the new the new heaven or the new idea that you have. So it's related to the concept of sin because you see, like I was saying before in my example, you at one point you realize you don't like your current career, so you want a new one. So that's the mm-hmm. sin. That's mm-hmm. where I missed. Mm-hmm. I did something wrong. It doesn't have to be moral or moral sin. It could be any kind of sin. I did something <laughs> wrong, so what do I have to do? I have to create a new world. So to create a new world, you need these things that I was describing, the water to wash and the flesh to make a new world. Uh, does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, so the, so the like water, that. yeah, no, that's good. So the water is an acceptance. 
and then the flesh is the new beginning. The flesh is the 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 building, um, of, it, yeah. the, the building of the new uh, understanding, the yeah. new communication, the new you know the whatever is new. Uh, yeah, yeah. So and so if I've so as an individual, if I have um, done th- done something, said something that wasn't you know, a kind, said something that was unkind, then, and I want to atone for that, then the acceptance is this washing away, right? The acceptance, washing away. There's sometimes tears, right? Yeah. There's sometimes tears. It's, when re- you it's also repentance. So Yeah, repentance. I, just, I think I understand what you mean by acceptance, but it's something like yeah, repentance. repentance. Yes. It's also yes. acceptance that I did something that's not right or... It's the mm-hmm. same thing. So if so, you yeah. want to repent your, of your sins. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so that's the water part. That's the water part. And well, then, think about this. When, when mm-hmm. baptism, that's what baptism is. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Like Jesus, um, John the Baptist baptizes. What is it? What is the meaning of his baptism? It's about repentance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's like the first step. He's, he's doing the first step, which is the cleaning of the person, putting him in water and mm-hmm. getting them out of the water, that's the, the blood part, right? The, the water part. Mm-hmm. And then after that, there's the other part, which I guess he's not the one doing, I guess it's Jesus in that in that context who's doing that. And see, when Jesus comes out of the water, when in, on his baptism, there then there's a bird that comes from heaven and lands on him. Right. And you see, that's the same as offering, it's, it's like offering him to God, but in that in that uh, imagery, it's it's the heaven that's coming down. But it's always both: the heaven comes down and the earth goes up, and then they join. That's mm-hmm. the, it's the idea. Yeah, I like that. That's good. It's good, eh, right? When God comes down and the earth comes up, it's good. <laughs>